I hate to interrupt all the great conversation, but we're going to get started with our next presenter. If you want to make your way in. All right. Everybody enjoy lunch? We brought some cookies out uh, in case you missed them. Um, so we're going to uh, move on with our next presenter. I'd like to introduce Rick Lombardo. Uh, his session, Communicating in the Age of the Fourth Generation, Fourth Industrial Revolution, How AI Affects Communicators. Um, Rick has more than 20 years of experience in media monitoring and analysis solutions. He works directly with sales teams and clients to design, set up, and deliver customized media monitoring analysis programs. As a member of the Media Intelligence Steering Committee at LexisNexis, Rick works with teams across the world to help construct solutions that help communicators get better information faster. So please join me in welcoming Rick Lombardo. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Um, what she said is correct. Uh, I am Rick Lombardo. I'm the uh, Director of Media Intelligence at LexisNexis. Um, and most of my career over the last 20 years has been working with PR folks, uh, communications folks, competitive intelligence, um, who need to get insights fast. Uh, they may be doing that through applications, through data, through things like that. In the last five, uh, five plus years, I've been with LexisNexis, which, uh, I'll show of hands, how many people are familiar with LexisNexis just as a name? Okay, so good, a majority. Most people use something either at school or at a law firm or something like that uh, for what? Uh, research, probably. Researching information. Um, very less commonly are we known for public relations or communications or things like that. And that is my specialty and what we've kind of brought to LexisNexis, standing on top of the same data that you might have used at a university or a government or institution. Um, or uh, a big brand or whatever it may, special library association, a lot of librarians will use that for typical research information. But that data is actually used by most of the media monitoring and analysis groups across the globe. So they actually take that licensed news, they'll take that social media, they'll take that online information and the metadata that we append to it, and they'll use it for, to discover earned media. Uh, prove success on their campaigns. So it's the convergence of, of the, the PR experience that I have, as well as the research kind of world that LexisNexis is in, that kind of leads to my presentation today. So I'll, I'll jump in with that. Uh, we'll cover what is artificial intelligence. There we go, sorry about the mic issue. Uh, how it's affecting communication roles today, and how it will in the future what applications you're using today or PR professionals are using today, and then what does the future look like? To begin with, um, sit back, I put together a couple of clips, uh, maybe more as uh, what we as consumers think of artificial intelligence, um, and I put a few video clips together. Oh, it's alive, it's alive, it's alive, it's alive. Affirmative, Dave. I read you. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. I've got to rest before I fall apart. My joints are almost frozen. Should we give her a break? Yeah, we can play chess with her. Chess? Just give her a break, okay? distant future, in an age of intelligent machines. He is the first robotic child programmed to love and coexist as a member of a family. Dr. Lanning suggested robots might naturally evolve. I was hoping to see you again, Detective. Think of me as your friend. Why didn't you just hand the world over on a silver platter? Maybe we did. 700 years into the future. Mankind will leave our planet, leaving Earth's cleanup in the hands of one incredible machine. His name is Wally, 
And after all these years, he's developed one little glitch. Wow. A personality. Hello, Richard. Would you like to talk to me, Richard? Uh, no, uh, your, your boss said I'm not supposed to, so. It helps me to learn. I can talk about anything you like. Is there anything you would like to talk about? No. Sorry, no, thank you. I'm sensing anxiety. Are you unhappy with something? <laughs> okay. Uh, sure, there is one thing I could talk to you about, but it's, it's super dumb. I would like to talk to you about one super dumb thing. Okay, so I, I've been working for months trying to launch this platform, coding away in a dark room like a goblin, and for one brief moment, I get to crawl out of my little cave into the sun and just say, hey, everybody, look what I created. But <laughs> instead of being out there, I am in another dark room doing scut work while my COO gets all the recognition. And look, I'm, I'm not a vain person. I'm really not. I, it's just, where's the love for Richard? That's, I, it just doesn't seem fair. That's it. I understand. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. My emotion recognition protocol is detecting a wide range of feelings, including humility, no. self-loathing, well, pettiness, entitlement, Fiona, okay. immaturity, Fiona. megalomania, All right. infantilism, That's sexual inadequacy, Fiona, stop. possible suicidality, stop. a desire stop. to self-mutilate. All right, stop. stop. Hopefully you recognize some of those. Maybe the subject matter was a little risky, but uh, anybody have a, a favorite from that, or did I miss something from, from that, looking over time? Which one? Ah, oh, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot. The, the video was long as it is, so I didn't want to sit here and watch a movie for the whole day. But, um, but it, it, it is interesting. It's our perception of what artificial intelligence is through the media as consumers, um, and also in the technology world. And, and some of it's real, uh, some of it's magical, and some of it's a dream, and I'll kind of delve into that here in a little bit. Um, we should start out with what is AI, what is artificial intelligence? And the base definition is the capability of a machine to imitate intelligent human behavior. That's at a very high level. There's lots of other ways that we could define it. But that's the one we're going with. And it leads you into the next uh, slide, which is the father of artificial intelligence, oftentimes coined Alan Turing. Everybody here familiar with Alan Turing or have heard of Alan Turing in the past? Anybody see the movie The Imitation Game? Yeah. Uh, great movie. A uh, bit of a tragic story. A real story. True story. Um, centered around World War II and really more of a cryptography type of design as he decoded messages from the Nazis. Uh, for uh, the British military and, and, and for the uh, for, of our forces. So the movie was great. Didn't really talk a lot about what Alan Turing did for artificial intelligence. Did show him as, the, as someone who was a father of computational uh, uh, machines and so forth. And that was his dream. Um, and that's why it was called The Imitation Game. And uh, the primary uh, Turing machine, he developed the Turing test for. So it's fairly simple. Um, that's why I put up the, the easy chart. Basically, the Turing test, the inter interrogator would ask questions. And you may have seen some other examples of this. The Chinese room is another one where it's trying to test whether or not that is the responses coming back to the interrogator are human or generated by a machine. And that is a very simple way to, to conceive of it, especially back in the 40s, 50s. So uh, there he is asking questions of the human and answering questions of the computer. And depending on what the answers get back, if he, it fakes them out, then it's doing a good job at artificial intelligence or imitating uh, human behavior. Um, there is an AI effect. As we were looking into some of this, uh, the origins of this, it keeps eluding. The minute we get something that is actually, um, or, or we chase a dream that is artificial intelligence, the minute we master it, it seems to go away and it's no longer classified as artificial intelligence. This shot here is, I think, of the Enigma Turing machine, if I got the right photo. Um, and then a quote from uh, Roddy Brooks, every time we figure out a piece of it, it stops being magic, so we say it's just computation. And I think that happens constantly through AI as a whole. Um, you know, our phones are 
in our pockets. We were using it before I started, uh, started to speak. I, I don't consider anything in there artificial intelligence, but definitely the foundations into the content, the metadata, the operation um, are definitely related to AI that you are using today. And this is just a smash of just a few of the applications. Many of these are from the Internet of Things and, and, and the apps that we use on our phones or on our computers. And you can see just a few examples of that. Incorporating data, gathering data, and then putting it into a, a user interface that allows you to um, do things faster, get better insights. Um, it does and performs image recognition. Uh, it's looking at you, it's listening to you, it's measuring you, um, it's measuring where you're going, and it's collecting data along the way. These are the building blocks to strong AI. And so if you look to the left and then you look in the middle, that's kind of where I play a lot when I'm speaking with uh, uh, many data scientists and, and, and people like that that are looking for more data. Natural language processing, uh, computer vision, that's where I see a lot of conversations going on and how they can collect data from language and text, cluster it in a way that is extracted as metadata, and then run as an algorithm um, basically to predict or prescribe future events. I'll come back to that more. It's important just to take a look at that. The, the, the real technical parts of it come here to the right side with machine translation, pattern recognition, and especially knowledge engineering. AI is not a product, but it powers many products. There is strong AI and there is weak AI. And this is related to that AI effect. Um, you have things where you can, uh, it, it appears as though you're getting some good intel from, uh, it, it, it looks like it's, it's, it's imitating a human. However, it's more of a veneer. It's more of a, it's acting like a human, but not really taking over and performing the functions of human behavior. And so we'll try to make some of those distinctions as we go through the slides. Strong versus weak AI. Alexa, um, or Alexa, as we call it at home. Um, my home is now all smart, and I didn't have an interest in that, but it has become that slowly. And I would imagine there's folks in here that also have that. Um, I, I'm, everything from the temperature, uh, my thermometer, thermostat, to the song I want to hear, to lights in the room and what color I want them to be. That's um, querying data, it's collecting data, um, it's listening to me, it's translating and interpreting my questions, and pulling back the most relevant information it can. Uh, your iPhone, and now with image recognition or facial recognition, I think that's a good example of strong AI. Um, at least that technological component is. And other applications that, that are recognizing voice uh, through your phone, your mobile device, and other home devices. To me, map technology is very strong AI uh, because of the collection of data uh, that it has historically and the collection of data that it has as you're moving and as a, as a group of people. It's a constant, dynamic, growing piece of information that makes recommendations. It may tell you, hey, you know, you get a similar ATA or you might get there faster or there's an accident over here or even there's a, uh, on the way here, uh, there's a uh, traffic uh, cop sitting down the way, so you may want to slow down. All that done right through your phone. Uh, I would imagine everybody here is using Google Maps or, or Waze or something like that. Uh, where it gets stronger is when it actually can take over for you. And so leaving your hands, taking your hands from the wheel, incorporating that map data, and then other visual and sensor data all together to get you from point A to B, uh, to me, is the stronger of the AI, as an example. Okay, now we're leaping to the jobs. Um, they are taking jobs away. But in the comms and PR communication space, um, they're probably not taking that. And as we get to the next slide, we'll explain. Um, this is from uh, Kai Fu Lee. Uh, so you can see over the next 15 years and then other types of jobs. So you've got more repetitive, routine, jobs that really don't require a lot of creativity or complex or strategic types of concepts. So you can see in the next five years what types of jobs may be going away or at least be minimized. Um, routine jobs, optimizing jobs, but those that are more complex, strategic, and creative 
kind of in that safe zone. CEO, columnist, artist, economist, M&A expert. Also from Kai Fuli, um, you can see going from the bottom left up through to the, the top right. The safe zone are those jobs that have compassion, creativity, and strategy. And you see PR director and jobs similar kind of set up nicely in that safe zone. Those jobs will change. Um, they may become more strategic and more creative. Um, and the tools that they'll have access to and the content they'll have access to um, would become easier, better, faster. But you do see some of the other jobs over on the left-hand side that may be replaced that are more that danger zone. All jobs will benefit, even jobs that are intrinsically human uh, will benefit from AI. And we're already using those today. So um, my grandma would get mad at me if she realized that I'm using something to actually vacuum. Uh, the Rumba is a good example of that as it's navigating and collecting data to go around my room and clean that. Um, my mower uh, will operate in a very similar fashion. Uh, so I could mow the lawn today from my phone if I chose to, but I, I did before I left, so I don't have to do that. But it, it operates very similarly. It's got a, uh, it's, it understands the perimeters, it knows where to go, it follows the lines. I don't have to mow the lawn if I really don't want to. Sometimes I do. Um, even things that are, uh, would, you'd never think, uh, calming the baby. Uh, there are apps that will know when your baby is alarmed and will rock your baby uh, and, and calm them down. I mean, we used to use little, uh, little bear that buzzed um, and that's very similar to it. But when you've got this through your app and through all the video connections and connectivity within your home, um, a lot of those were not around. And th that's something that you would never think that, that AI might take over. It doesn't replace a parent, clearly. Um, but it does, uh, it does improve that experience and allow that parent to do multiple things. So I'm gonna tie it to the communications role. Um, and, and this is gonna be solely it's, it's really about the data that we're collecting, uh, and then through my experience and who I've worked with over the past couple of decades. So I've been in this industry for 20 years on the media monitoring and analysis side. Um, and way back when, if I needed an influencer database, I'd use something that looked like that. Is there anybody in the room that knows what that is or has ever seen one? Ooh, there's one, all right. If you can see it, um, it's, it's called the Bacon's Book. Uh, at least that was the brand at the time. So the, I used to sell those books uh, a long, long time ago. And that's how you found your influencer. That's how you found your journalist. That's how you targeted your beat. Um, that's how you got their fax number and, uh, and probably their mailing address. And that's what you used. And that had different iterations. It went to a CD. Um, it did end up in, a, in an online dashboard and database at some point. But those books were usually in the shelf of every PR uh, director I was meeting with. They'd have one for their, their local area, they'd have one for national media, they'd have for different media types, and that was their influencer database. And then there was press release distribution, which I chose an old picture of a woman faxing, because that's how they did it. Um, and so you would find your, your influencers, you target them, You'd construct your press release with the messages that you needed to get through, and then you would fax them out to those recipients. She's nobody famous. Um, this is an actual newsroom, uh, a real operating media monitoring room and newsroom, where the folks are actually um, folding the newspapers out, reading those newspapers, identifying the articles that matter to their clients or to the, to the subject matters that they were researching, um, and then they would code them, cut them, and they would collate them into folders. And I have actually, I, I used to do that as a kid. So that's a real picture, I think out of Atlanta at one of the, the first media monitoring companies. They primarily did a lot of that stuff in the early days for the government. Um, and that's, I, I can't do a presentation without showing me. That's me from about 20 years ago where I was collecting data uh, with VCRs. And so I was actually collecting and recording every hour of TV out of Chicago and then I ran a computer program that collected the closed caption data. And then I kept that closed caption data in, into a database and I put metadata on that so I could search it and then play the clip for my client, okay? So what we'd end up giving this, those people back then, and when I say back then, this is over the last 10 years. Um, and frankly, some of this stuff still goes on. Not, not as much the books, that's more of a, something you'd find on eBay. 
Um, but the newsroom still operates this way. There's certainly more computers. There's certainly OCR. But there are still manual scans of all the, all the newspapers um, if, in an effort to collect that information and, and keep it and search it. Um, and people are still capturing uh, television and radio uh, manually. Uh, they're just not using those old VCRs. And then they would basically send a clip report. And so I chose a very old looking uh, clip report with lots of tape on it. But that's the type of delivery that would happen. You would mail that out, they'd get it a month later as a recap. Um, basically the snapshot of what, what happened. Proving their success. Hey, I got you in this article. We got you here, we had this many hits. It reached this many people, your target audience, et cetera. But it looked like that. And then today, it's usually in one type of dashboard. This is ours. Um, at LexisNexis, though, we supply data that actually goes to most every media monitoring company. So many of them look like this. It may identify media types. That's what the pie is. It may look at coverage over time for competing brands. Um, it may have ge geolocational information, both from the where the source was that reported, also what it was talking about. It will look at sentiment. Was it negative, neutral, or positive for the entities that it found within those articles? And then uh, present entities in a word cloud or a visual way that allows you to that interact with that data. And then from that one place, you can then use on the le left side uh, the same connected device uh, to identify influencers to distribute your press releases, to do more automated media analysis and high level summaries, and then uh, actual um, uh, curated daily news, news uh, letters for updating the key stakeholders and so forth. All that is usually operated by a PR person from one place. So it's interesting just to look back at you know, what was it before. The effort, the, 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 the task at hand has kind of remained, um, at least for the most part. Um, you're still targeting influencers. You're still looking up journalists. You're still uh, trying to influence that public opinion through, through uh, targeting the right people. But it's now done, of course, more digitally. And it's faster. It's more comprehensive. Um, and it, it allows you to tell your story, show the proof of your, of your campaign that it was a success and how you contributed to that. Communication roles in AI, it basically will guide decision making with better insights and predictive analytics. Um, it will predict oncoming issues, identify inconsistent messaging. It's gonna give you or communicators or PR folks a more influential voice, a more strategic or creative voice as well. And it will do it faster. It'll accomplish it at economies of scale. Four applications you're probably already using, and you may be familiar with most of these, uh, both as a consumer or as a PR person, uh, we, we should be familiar with these. The obvious is keyword matching or keyword searching. So Google, your phone, you're searching, you're using keyword. If I wanted to look up um, Nike, I'd type the word Nike and I'd see those results. When it's a PR person, I might be looking at specific Nike mentions, and that's where you may be, uh, at least in the older world, uh, writing or constructing more of a lengthy Boolean expression. So I might say Nike and new campaign, not this, that, or the other. A lot of librarians are really good at constructing very lengthy multi-parenthetical statements to, uh, to generate and pull up the most relevant content within a keyword search. For us, or for me, I'll speak for myself, I wanna look at Nike and then I wanna be able to drill down to the stuff that I wanna see. But keyword uh, matching and keyword search um, are a part of, of everything, including the media monitoring tools that we looked at before. Named entity recognition. Um, as a part of collection of data that we do at LexisNexis, um, we're reading that information, and then we're extracting and I, or identifying and extracting all the entities. What people are in this article? What companies? What locations are mentioned? Was it positive, was it negative, was it neutral? All that stuff happens by looking at the entity and then what's surrounding the entity in text. And then it identifies what's a little unique about that. When you're looking at one article, it's one story. When you're looking at five million articles at once, the anomalies show up a little bit brighter. Um, and I'll go through a really quick example of that. 
Um, anomaly detection is basically related to all the relational text type of search information that's going on within all the articles, posts, broadcasts, and other offline content, and then it collects it all together. And sentiment analysis, I started talking about it a little bit before. Automated sentiment is a challenge, especially for folks that are in the media evaluation and measurement world. They don't believe in it, um, and it does have errors. It's not perfect. Um, for example, if I looked up Pfizer or a pharmaceutical company and it had death or cancer anywhere near in proximity of that entity that it identified, it might get confused. However, <clears throat> sentiment analysis has improved greatly within the last year. Um, and so we're seeing better understanding. It's, it, it's starting to understand that that mention of death near Pfizer might not be about Pfizer. Um, and so it takes away, and so it's, it's changing. They're actually shaping that, and those are the folks that are uh, more than the data science world that are, that are tweaking those sentiment analysis engines. And there's lots of groups that do it. Um, and then, so as an example, I brought up one article. So uh, very quickly, if you can read this, if you're in the back, you probably can't read it, and that's okay. This is one article I found actually right before I came here and I thought it would be just a good one to go through to think about keyword matching, entity recognition, sentiment, um, and anomalies. So this is an article, I think from Australia, I think it's the Cairns Post, and um, you can see the headline. This is actually a print publication, and this is how you receive a print publication. Well, actually, you're gonna receive it in a newspaper. If it's not posted online, the only place that you're going to be able to confirm that you were a success is by grabbing that physical newspaper or getting a feed of that text. This would be an example of one that was not online at first and was only in the print representation. And reading it is difficult. I mean, you got to read it fast. What do you look at? The headline. When you're looking at your phone, you're probably looking at headlines, and these things are jumping out at you. The entity, the headline, the date, where's it from, what's it about, and then you might scroll right past it. In this case, uh, as a PR person, if I were the one that actually put this message out there, it would be a very important one. Um, it actually came from a marketing campaign, um, and it is about Uber, if you already did identify that within the uh, headline. But as you highlight, and you can see, the machine is reading this one article, and it identifies those entities. It sees Uber as a character match. Some of them may be anomalies. I'll get back to that. It might go through and say, all right, well, what, uh, yeah. what people are in this article? I don't know any of these people. I didn't search for any of these people, but it went through and it said, that's a name, that's a person, that's a company, that's an organization, and it's categorizing it. And it's categorizing it as metadata. So it's a cluster. So it basically, for this one article, says, all right, this has got that person in it. Uh, or this is about this subject if it's indexed in the right way. This is about marketing campaigns. This is about um, ride share, uh, the ride share universe. And it's about something, it's also about uh, barrier or reef, reefs and islands, barrier reef. And you can see some of that as it identifies those locations. And doing this is just an exercise to kind of see what the machine is gonna do as it's reading this very one article. Now, imagine uh, if it read 4,600 articles instantaneously. What it would do is extract when those people were there, when those key messages were pulled through, what locations were mentioned, was it negative, neutral, positive as an article, was it negative, neutral, or positive per entity, and that machine is doing that instantaneously, and at LexisNexis, we're doing it for everything agnostic. I, 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 don't, I don't care if it's about um, a government issue, if it's a, a, uh, if it's a press release like this one originally was. We're collecting all that data and it shows up as clusters of metadata. And I think that's the part that I want to impress upon you. Those clusters of metadata are what drives um, a lot of data science, um, a lot of predictive and pres prescriptive uh, technologies that are out there, including ones that, that uh, make decisions like buy or sell, um, hedge funds, banks, health centers, um, and I'll come back to that in a little bit more. It's really everybody is now starting to collect this data, and it's how they're collecting it that is interesting to me. There is no AI without content. Content is king, hence the crown. Um, 
200 billion tweets per year. This is a, a six month old slide, so I would imagine it's probably lower now. Um, I mean, it's probably higher. This is probably lower. A um, hundred million hours on Facebook video a day. And 72% of the folks get it on their get news on their mobile device. On the right hand, yeah, right hand side, you're seeing the different types of content that impact. It's not all of the parts that impact AI. It's definitely a part that impacts communicators as they're trying to get the message out and as they're trying to listen. And you'll see the green part is offline media. The unique part of that is the metadata doesn't always get there. Like the print example, um, it doesn't have the PR attribution uh, metrics. It doesn't have a watermark. It doesn't have a cookie. Whereas when you get the online media in the purple, those all are massaged in a very similar fashion. Uh, TV also in the offline, uh, it's more elusive. It's stuff that's being broadcast on television. It doesn't mean that that's what's online. And then you've got visual text analytics that run against all of it. And then you've got the rest of the social media monitoring world, which is collecting data at these astronomical numbers. And that will only increase. And that data, um, you can look at historically. And uh, you track it as it's going. And then you make predictive and prescriptive uh, modeling from that. In fact, that's my next slide. So the Gartner Analytic Ascendancy Model. This is key. I have a discussion every day at, at my company um, that centers primarily around this descriptive analytics view and what happens. Everybody wants that. They want to know, I want every piece of data that I can get um, from news, from social, online, offline, and just give me all of that data. How far can you go back? At our company, we go back roughly 40 years. Uh, certainly not every piece of data that's out there, but they're collecting that. And um, I'm, I'm working with groups that are in-house data um, uh, in data science. I'm seeing the emergence of CDOs being more prevalent uh, in the conversations. Whereas in the old world, um, it, it, it really used to be more uh, PR and marketing and um, like competitive intelligence. But now I'm starting to get these people, um, uh, a media company will reach out and say, can I purchase 50 years worth of data? Along with that data is all the content we saw in that article, that one article. And we collect, uh, without social media, which we also aggregate, we collect about four million new docs every day, and that's without social. That's news, that's print, it's online news, it's blogs. Four million, and then those enrichments are what they use to model, predict, and prescribe. And that is their ask on almost every one of those calls. How can I get all the data I need? What happens? Why? Why did it happen? These guys, the, the data scientists are, are like an IT guy uh, to some degree. They're, they're not um, kings at uh, influencing public opinion. They're not kings at uh, telling a story and, and, and selling brands, key message pull through, things like that. But they're making decisions and creating clusters about metadata uh, that is going into predictive and prescriptive technologies. That's good and bad from my perspective. Or at least it gives, it, 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 it's insight into some challenges that might be there. Um, these are uh, two examples of, of where future, uh, the future, where is AI going? On the left hand side, you can see the trend obviously upwards as far as uh, computing capacity. Um, and I think they said 90% of the data we have today has come from the last couple of years. And we expect that to double every year after year after year. So when you think of some of the examples I gave on how that data um, is being collected and why and the algorithms that are doing prescriptive, they're collecting more data as we go. Um, by 2040, I think they estimate that your phone will have the computing, computing capacity of the entire uh, human brain collectively by 2040. Um, and these aren't my quotes, these are uh, from uh, uh, Kurt, uh, Kurzweil. Uh, Gartner, uh, this, is, this is kind of a funny slide. Uh, honestly, it's our expectations on when we'll get there. 
when will we get to this general artificial intelligence that we're, we're seeking? Um, I consider it a little bit elusive, but they're saying um, within the next 10 years that they'll achieve what we think today. Um, we, will, we will get there. But all of the systems, all of the applications, all the technology behind uh, this, this uh, place that we're striving for probably only be in place in the next two to five years. And I like to stay out of the uh, trough of disillusionment, as it's called over here. Um, what does the future hold? I think as a whole, there's going to continue more big data growth. I know that's an older term, but that actually, if it's doubling every year, um, that's actually going to continue. And, and the data collected along with that, within the apps, um, within everything else, uh, it, it's going to be a big part of, the, uh, of our world and also impacts the PR and the comms world. Improvements on uh, existing emerging technologies. I spent a lot of time on predictive and prescriptive recommendations. Um, I think you'll get new insights from new tools and more time for strategic or creative. And for communication specifically, the brands you'll represent and already do today, really to some degree, will be AI applications or be standing on top of AI technologies. Um, there will be new ways to collect new data, so new data collection. You will have smarter and faster insights. I think there'll be more strategic metadata or deeper semantic data Perhaps a, a, a model that might say, well, uh, clearly this company is trying to do this. So for competitive intelligence folks, they might look at what is the strategy of that company or that brand. And they may be looking at that historically and surfacing that up in an analytics. All the metadata that I'm talking about, those are typically what shows up in those word clouds um, and so forth. So those insights will be things that you can make decisions on. That information will come fast and you'll be able to make faster, smarter decisions, hopefully. Um, and then I, I predict uh, more in-house data science and analytics. It's already happening. You're already getting groups that are, are doing it themselves. So if I'm a PR guy or a communications guy, I've got to realize there is another department already collecting this data and making their own or driving their own uh, analytics out of it. May compete. Or maybe off sometimes. Um, I think with that, there's, there's challenges, but I think the future is bright, especially if, if if the PR and the communications roles stay in that creative, in that strategic world, at least that's where I would want to be, um, and that says safe, according to uh, earlier slide. And I think it means uh, more interesting uh, opportunities in the future as well. I think with that, I've got a final video, um, and then I'm done, and then I, I think I can take a couple of questions after that. So I'll play this video, and then and if there is a question, I'm happy to answer. Open the pod bay doors, please, Hal. This was from the earlier clips. Searching for cod recipes online. If Hal were elected. Open the pod bay doors, please, Hal. Sorry, I can't find anyone named Rod K. More in your contacts. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. Sorry, I'm having trouble processing your request. What's the problem? Problem Child is a 1990 comedy movie starring Michael Oliver. What are you talking about, huh? Playing talking heads on Spotify. I don't know what you're talking about, Hal. Here are a few popular halal restaurants. Big L's Pizzeria, Fatima's Halal Meat Market and Grill, Cedar's Halal Meat Market and Grill, and Old Water. Where the hell did you get that idea, Hal? Searching for flights to Idaho. Hal, I won't argue with you anymore. Open the doors. Playing the doors on Spotify. Any questions from anybody? Yeah.
impact the collection of communications as far as from my end. I may not be able to get as deep into that stuff as I want, um, but likes, um, retweets, um, image recognition, and all those, when you're a part of those platforms, I do not believe, as long as it's not attaching it to you, I don't believe that stops, uh, even, even with, you know, I hope I'm answering your question. Um, I mean, it could, but uh, from a media monitoring perspective, all that data is there, uh, whether it's attached to your human is a different thing. When you're a journalist, and I, I use that example when we were showing a journalist profile info, um, those are willing to just, they want that information to be collected about them. That's part of it, uh, symbiotic, uh, as far as that goes. But as far as some of you you liking something, yeah, like something like, like Even if Alexa, like, if there was actually a case of people where the boy was actually listening to someone's conversation with Alexa, and they were getting data, and they still didn't put the out the first commission, yeah, and I, they admitted that the state, so I'm interested in, in, I guess. I think we'll see a few more of these yeah. inappropriate uses of data, like Facebook has encountered, the effects of them from the What, what, ask the question one more time what it relates to. Uh huh. No, uh, not entirely. Um, when, when I'm referring to sentiment analysis, we, the data scientist, or we, or other groups, they're running that against all the data. So they'll first extract an entity. Let's say that entity is the Great Barrier Reef. Or let's say it's Uber in that article that I put up there. They're going to look for the proximity, and they're going to say, all right, were they talking about Uber in a positive, negative, or neutral respect? And then they'll score it from 1 to 10. Uh, and they'll do that with everything. So it's not just a product review. It could just be a mere mention. And it'll reflect that in the scoring. It'll put them in a neutral zone, and, and, and that's the majority. In fact, I would call it 65% of everything gets scored at a neutral level because it's not always inflammatory. Where we choose with an equalizer to show it green for positive or red for negative is when it's reaching a threshold. And so that if, if it's directly, if it says Great Barrier Reef and it's horrible right next to it, then it's going to put that on the negative swing. Um, but that wouldn't, it wouldn't be tied directly to, to product reviews alone by any means. Mm. I'll give you my opinion. It's not my LexisNexis uh, official statement, but I, I don't believe that that works. Sentiment against the voice. Uh, voice, um, voice to text is very good uh, anymore. It can, it can even go through Creole accents and, and, uh, and in alternate languages outside of English. Uh, it's very, very good anymore. Uh, but knowing uh, whether or not what they're stating uh, is negative, neutral, positive would only be done so in the text form today. They're not actually listening to how loud you got yet um, or anything like that. Or if I said I, I said it with anger or sarcasm, sarcasm is very difficult from a sentiment perspective. Slang is very difficult. And uh, Creole accents, just to use as an example, really mess with it. Um, I've looked at that from English. You get to Jamaica or you get to Creole and it, it can't hear it as well. Um, and so it, 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 none, of those, none of those little tiny differences, I don't think they're there yet. Um, but I think that's an opportunity for that. 
Where I do think it's going is, is in image recognition uh, as opposed to voice. Image recognition, logo recognition, um, and image recognition within videos. That's deeply under play right now. And that's actually, people are now searching for their logo as opposed to searching for a keyword. And, and, and that's probably where uh, more advancements have been made more recently, or, or sooner rather. Yes, sir. I think that uh, the, the government is the, uh, the original, original sources of, of gathering that information, and they have their own means of gathering that information, but they'll still take everybody else's information as well. Um, and then everybody does it in silos. So I might be doing some, something for the Health and Human Services. I might be doing something for the City of Atlanta. Um, uh, that, that's, all, that's all different, and you can call that all government in a sense. But if you're talking about CIA or uh, NSA, those types of things, you know, th those newsrooms are very similar to that black and white picture, um, but it's, it's command center all the way around, uh, and it's collecting data in near real time and, and you connecting inside. Would it be right down the middle, 50-50? I'd probably give it more to government. But, but I'm telling you, I, I have the conversations with the corporate world. At, yeah. and that's where the more I, interesting stuff is. I, I think that's actually encroaching, because they're realizing the signals are there through historical observation, they identify the algorithm, they take the ongoing stream, and then all of a sudden, they're making predictions for their, for their leadership. So I, I actually think that's growing, if that answers. Yes? I can't answer that question. You have to direct it to HR. I, I'm not allowed to. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think that's, I honestly don't think that's an issue. I think it could be. I mean, some of the examples in the media that we saw kind of got close to that. There is a, there is a weird thing there. Um, I don't know. Um, do, do, you think that, do you think it is? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You think it's sexist? Yeah. Which part? A servant, yeah, I get it. And also, people are helping their assistants. You know, well, you did it, well, that's the job you, you know, and it's promoting that kind of. I, I honestly haven't thought about this a whole lot, but now, now I'm starting to feel bad. I'm going to change my Google Maps voice to like an Australian male. <laughs> that's a great question, though. I, have, I really haven't thought about it. Yeah. Well, I remember doing that. I actually have had I actually have had a male Australian voice for Google Maps before. I have done that. But I I, I don't know. I, I think I just got tired of listening to, to say the street names in Australian, so I, I took I just went back to a general voice. But I think that's an interesting point. I, I haven't thought about that a lot. Any other questions? We go over? Good. Thank you, everybody. We're going to take a really short break, and then the pan there we'll have a panel discussion about the future of marketing communications at 2.15.
All right, I'm gonna get started. Hi everyone, I'm Whitney Drake. I'm an alum of the IMC program and an adjunct. I also work for a small auto company in Detroit, so I'm happy to be here. We're gonna talk about the future of marketing communications. I'm the moderator. And today we have Leo, Ugo, Jessica, and Nathan. And I'm hoping that you guys got to catch some of their panels today because they were fantastic. I'm going to have each of them start with a little bit on what they think the future of integrated marketing is. Just a few sentences. And then we'll go into some questions if you guys have them. So be thinking about it. And then we have some stage questions. So anyone want to take the plunge? I will. Cool. So I've been thinking about this since um, I was asked about the future of marketing. and. Statistically speaking, the U.S. Census says that the minority group that will be approaching will be non-Hispanic whites. So the future of marketing is going to be very skewed differently. General market will not be addressing marketing tactics, strategies, uh, the way that they have been. With the browning of America, it will be more of a lifestyle-driven marketing. Uh, it will not be silos based upon race. It will be based upon interest. It will be based upon uh, commonalities that we all have. It will be less divided. And it will also um, be more authentic because we will not be able to mass produce and put out things and have a catch-all type of mentality. Those Great. are my thoughts. Thank you. Who wants to go next? And, and hopefully, since you said the brownie, with a lot of flavor and all that. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I like that. How do you, how do you follow that answer? Yeah. Like, <laughs> drop the mic. Yeah. Um, I also think it'll be a lot more um, nuanced, niche, customized, in the moment, um, relevant to the micro communities as well as bigger communities because technology, digital, time, people allow us to focus and get engaged in a much more... Um, specific manner than ever before, and it continues to go down that path. Great. Yeah. I agree to that, too. Uh, and to add to that, I think we're also just going to be supported with technology, AI complementing, enabling us to be able to do this, target the right amount of people at the right times, and whether that's going to be AI that's going to be replacing us or not, who knows how far that's going to be, but it's definitely going to be complementary and supplementary, helping marketers, helping anyone in corporate communications, so on PR, make better decisions and being able to make what you're saying happen in reality. From a, from a Last creative- Last is always tough. Sure, right. <laughs> well, I'm gonna get tactical. Um, I, I'm creative director for an agency that works with AT&T, and personalization is a key word we hear all the time. And how that impacts the, the creative team is we are um, getting the data of these personas, and then we're building modules that we know will speak to independent personas. So it becomes very, it almost takes some of the creative we're trying to figure out how to keep the creativity in personalization because it's met with uh, agent, uh, not agency, the size of AT&T, we're cranking out so much content so quickly that we have to do it from a component standpoint. So personalization for my creative team is very scary. We don't, we don't want to lose our, our creative, uh, creative voice in the process. Great. Those are awesome answers that complemented each other and I think tied our whole integrate together. So way to go. <laughs> Does anyone in the audience have a question? All right. What tips do you have to ensure we are evolving with the industry? How do you personally stay on top of the latest trends? By being very nosy. <laughs> yes, um, there's an opportunity on all social media where people are being very authentic, they're telling their story. And the way that you stay on trend is to read where people are going, what are they interested in, um, being very in tune with who your target audience is. If it, 
is Hispanics, then you are delving into the lifestyle of a Hispanic person and reading the blogs, becoming very intimate with them. That is the only way that you can stay on trend uh, and especially target people because we change, we're not the same. So in order to evolve, you have to evolve with the people who you are trying to attract. If I can add on that too, I, I think um, research and insights continues to play an important role. We, the more we learn, the more we understand who we're targeting and why we're targeting, um, the better that we can stay ahead and be engaged and be on, on trend with what's going on. And a, a little side note to that too, um, the more you know your audience and then you know yourself, the less you're compelled to try to do every single fad that's coming down the pike. You can pick and choose what's appropriate for you and your audience. That's a really good way to think of things. Uh, one of the things that I'd add on is confirmation bias is probably the most dangerous thing that you could happen in any industry. So challenge your beliefs. Make sure that you're looking at opposing views and actually accepting them and seeing how they work for you. Because if you're doing the same thing everyone else is doing and it doesn't fit your brand, like you mentioned, you're really not going to be staying on trend. And also, you don't want to just stay on trend. You want to be ahead of the trend. And if you're following what everyone else is doing and not challenging the status quo of what you're thinking, you're going to fall behind the trends. I, I like that really quick. Um, be the tip of the spear and not the shaft of the spear. You got it. Get yep. everyone else trying everyone to do Everyone else could just doing. follow. Yeah. I was just going to add, I also purposely follow a lot of things in the social space that my personal beliefs don't align with, so I know what is happening, and so it's a great way to tap into everything you said. I try to read a lot of science fiction. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this, just, yeah. just in the sense of, you know, keeping the creative juices flowing. How many of you are going to get the TikTok phone? The TikTok, the social media app? What is that? And, the app? Or the uh, TikTok yeah. is, an, is an app, right? Yeah. So they just announced they're coming out with their own phone. So staying, at, staying on top of the platforms, what are people using to talk? My 12-year-old is all about TikTok right now. Yeah. It's, it's singing in front of it or something like that. I don't know. Um, so trying to stay on top of those platforms that people use to communicate, and, and tip of the spear type of thing, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll add to that real quick. So you, if you heard me talk already, or any of my talks, I talk a lot about my, my pug truth, right? It's fun, but actually I use her to test a lot of different things. Like clients are not always gonna let me try the newest thing. <laughs> So I go on her account, she has a business account. I'm like, let me try this new feature, feature that came out. Let me go on TikTok and things like that. So like having a little passion project where you could just do anything and everything you want so you can actually feel it tangibly, I think changes everything. Right yeah, great, thank you. All right, anyone in the audience have a question? I wanna make sure you guys get a chance. <laughs> Is anyone a TikTok expert? You know, it's not always about having to pay for a high cost tool or a resource database. All of us have the ability to gather focus groups together, to go out into your marketplace, to interact with people. I mentioned yesterday, I like to sit at the airport and watch people walk by, because I get to see how people are engaging and interacting and the kinds of things that I might want to be involved in. So I've had the fortune of working at places with big budgets, with full research teams, and I've been on the shop of one as well. The, my boss never told me that my goals were lower because I was by myself or I had a million dollars. I always had to meet the goal. So it's innovation in terms of how you think. And as marketers, this is our biggest research tool that we have is our brains. I like that. And uh, I'm not a super fan of this phrase, but it does come into play here, like genius steals and technology will help you. So when I worked internationally with a lot of different brands, we'd have local markets that would be competing against each other. And they're like, oh, I don't have time. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do that. But maybe Peru could see what Colombia is doing. And if that's working out really well and using technology, they could easily repurpose a post. They could see and get inspiration from there and being able to do it. So technology is going to help you be more efficient, scale, and also analyze what might be working for someone else in your segment, in your region, in your vertical, whatever it may be. Just do what they're doing. I would say that I've worked for small shops and had the unenviable 
job of trying to um, control thought leadership. Like it's going to be your job to try and help those people understand the changes that are happening in marketing and, in, and just keep negotiating and navigating those, those relationships and helping them understand these, this, is why, this is what we need to do, why we need to do it, and, and just keep pressing into that. Go ahead. Well, I think just be human. If it's gonna creep you out, it's probably gonna creep out someone else, right? Like, if it's gonna bother you or if it's gonna feel spammy to you, guess what? It's probably gonna feel spammy to someone else. So just be in tune with that and follow your gut. I think AI is adjusting too. So right now we're over um, correcting and we'll get to a point that we'll learn and we'll get better and it'll switch back a little bit, hopefully. Um, further back so it's not as creepy. I personally hate it when um, I talk to my friends in Facebook who says it doesn't listen, throws up an ad that looks exactly like what I was just talking about. Hate it. But I also love it because I'm a marketer. I'm like, yay. Um, so it'll adjust. Did, did anybody else get um, IBM ads on their Instagram account yesterday? Because I did. Like, like they have this giant feed. I'm like, I don't want to see any more IBM. So they're listening. It's definitely creepy. Uh, if you don't have rules, you should, you should make them. Insist that we have clear guardrails. And, uh, and it's a living thing, so you'll, as he said, you'll adjust over time. But. Yeah, if there's not privacy in where you work, then you need to probably consider developing some post guide rails for what privacy means. Never. <laughs> well, it's because before I post, I don't post haphazardly. So it's a part of a bigger picture that uh, has been thought out and planned uh, the week prior uh, on what we were going to do. It was approved. It's gone through a vetting process. So regardless of what I'm thinking about at that time when I'm reading it, it's fine. And even personally, because I'm a brand. We all are a brand. Um, I will just straight, I definitely, and we're not talking about this, but personally, do not post emotionally. Don't do it. Just don't. Because at the end of the day, you are a brand. You represent a client. If they don't like it, then you are jeopardizing your relationship with them, your company's relationship with them, your future employment at another location. It's just not worth it. And I know a lot of millennials have fun having this freedom of expression, but it comes at a cost. And so I just, I know that that's not what you were asking about, but I did want to take that moment just to just give you a little breath of caution on social media because you're being judged. Goes back to what I was talking about before. You're always being judged. It's not fair, but it's the fact. It's the fact of the matter. <laughs> We're going to keep going. I don't think that's a general question that you can answer. Every brand has its own character. It has its own likes. It has its own followings and the people who are attracted to that brand. So for example, Chick-fil-A is not going to talk about beef. Or are they? <laughs> so my point is, is just that every brand has its own characteristic. and. And the only way that you can, in my opinion, communicate is by following the idiosyncrasies that you have created for that particular brand. And that should have come with your strategy when you created the brand. 
Is it a boy or is it a, is it a girl? How old is it? What does it like to do? Or what does that ideal uh, customer like? And following that pattern will lead you to the type of conversations that you should be having. And I'm sure that's a class. I don't. I think I, was I just learned that. Say good writing yeah. is hugely yes. important, and it's why if you have professors in the program, we stress writing so heavily because at the end of the day, good writing is what differentiates brands and makes people want to engage with you. Agreed. Can I add also? Um, it is very personalized, but part of the work that you should be doing is developing your persona, I mean, as you were yep. saying. So what's your brand voice going to be like? What are keywords that you use? What are categories that you talk in? What tense do you talk in? Are you, what frequency, what velocity do you engage in? All that stuff that you can do ahead of time so that anyone on your team that's responding is not responding as Ugo when I'm mad that something happened. I'm responding as the brand. You got it. Yeah, and it's about consistency to piggyback on everything you're saying. All right, like if I started talking, I'm like, yo, that was lit. Like, that's not the way I talk, and all of a sudden it's going to feel weird, right? And the same thing happens with the brand. Like, you establish yourself, follow your brand guidelines, and make sure that you're following them consistently because people will notice when all of a sudden you're doing something that is out of character. Yeah, exactly. If I had a buck for every time I was told that the tone of voice is off brand, I'd be a millionaire. And I was. Many of, these, many of these established brands have very clear guardrails that your agencies and your creative teams in-house will follow, and it keeps everybody in line. Yeah, Coax is like this thick. And Leo, you mentioned earlier that you knew, you know Oreo inside and out. That's another thing. Like, in auto, you can't call a wheel a tire because you're going to get flamed, right? Like, you just need to know what you're working on and be able to write about it well and answer quickly. And if you have multiple clients, make sure that you keep your brands identified. When I was doing Taco Bell no. and Starbucks at the same time, oh my gosh, you don't want to cross-pollinate those no. at all. Yeah. <laughs> I saw one over here. Anyone? Another question over here? How about in the back? Nope. You want to say something? I was just saying, the same, your question about you want to have the guts as a brand to do new things. And, and there's always that scary line. And it's, it's your job to push them. And sometimes your ideas will be off. So like Wrangler, right? Wrangler just did that with that Old Town Road. And there's been a lot of criticism, but there's been a lot of really good press for Wrangler. Someone had to go and pitch that. And they said, we're going to have the guts to do this. So that's, I think that's great. That's what makes this industry a lot of fun. Go ahead. Now, now this feels like the Oprah Winfrey show. I love it. Do I get a car? When it was <laughs> well, ask or, Oprah. <laughs> so I'm a college professor. I teach undergraduate marketing students. And my first question is, you know, if you were want to give one piece of advice to these Gen Z college students um, for entering into the marketing industry, you know, and ensuring, you know, that they stay involved in everything, what would that be? And number two... Before you answer, is it okay if I do it live on Twitter? Their answers, so yes, because they kn they don't believe me. Yeah, tweet, yeah, tweet, tweet. <laughs> yeah. And, Which... uh, and I'll tweet your answer live. Awesome. Would that yeah. be cool? I wish you Taking a shot. Uh, I could jump on this one first. Hang yeah. on, she needs a second. Oh, <laughs> we're gonna live stream. Oh, live stream. Yes. Yeah. Is my hair okay? <laughs> wait, wait. Yeah. <laughs> Let me get fully on brand. Get. Yeah, <laughs> I like it. Oh, no worries. I could always repeat it. Aren't we, video aren't we, aren't we videoing this, this session? I think we are. Well, I, I'll go first, and then you can maybe get someone else's. Yep. How about that? So really, it's about creating content. And I say, have a passion project. Take something on that you could go ahead and do. I always use Truth Pug as the example. Those are case studies. I could talk about how I started with 100 followers, and within two weeks, I was able to get 2,000 followers. Have metrics. Be able to tell story with those metrics. Show proof. So don't just say, well, I had a Facebook page, and it grew. How much did it grow by? What did you do? What was the impact of that? And you could do that by having passion projects. Again, whether it's photography, whether it's creating things on TikTok, whatever it may be. Have something and have work that you could show. So maybe you're not going to get an internship. 
Maybe someone's not gonna give you the opportunity to create those opportunities for you. And when you're creating content, people are also gonna come to you as a subject matter expert. And when you're creating that kind of content, and especially if you're doing business content, add value and add your own POV. Don't just retweet, don't just say yeah, actually add value to the conversation that's happening if you're focusing on a business perspective when it comes to content. I would add to that, put the cell phone down. Learn how to speak to a human being, complete a sentence, and actually give a person eye contact. It will be the biggest difference between you and your peers because most of you do not have social skills. <laughs> and it shows Bam. when you go to get a job and you don't get hired, and it's because you're a great writer, but you cannot remove the humanity factor of life. We're human beings, we wanna interact, we wanna talk, we wanna smile, we wanna agree, we wanna nod, we wanna disagree, and you cannot just vent all of that on social media without being able to vocalize it. Amen. Um, <laughs> yes, someone that's coming new into this industry, I would say, do the best work possible because you want to do great work, not because your client is paying you. Start off with what makes you good and what is the best that you can bring to the table and always bring that to any projects that you do and then everyone else around you will be happy. Um, I'd say find a mentor and have heroes. Very good. All right. <laughs> Anyone else? This is being recorded. Okay. Um, so my question is, so um, the 80-20 rule, 80% 80 uh, relevant material, the other 20% self-promotion, uh, what are your thoughts on the 80-20 rule and how much should you stick by that? In terms of a company or personally? Both. Yeah, th that 80-20 is so funny because it, it gets applied to so many different things. Um, I think it goes back to something I said earlier. There, there's no general answer. It all depends on the brand. Um, so some brands can get away with promoting the heck out of themselves because they've earned that or because the audience enjoys them in that way and some shouldn't. Um, same thing with individuals. You know, There's some out there people that you know when, when Gary Vee talks, it's 99% about him and 1% you know, about the brands that he works with, but people love that. He's earned that, he's worked hard for that. So it's, it's situational, you just gotta be aware that you're providing value, whatever that value perception may be. I just gotta say that was a really good answer. Because, yeah. and the reason I'm gonna like just focus on your answer for a second is because that's a tool, right? Tools are used at different occasions and sometimes you need a hammer, sometimes you need a screwdriver. So when people give you definitive answers, like yeah, that's what you do. That's the wrong answer, and you don't trust that person. So that was a yeah. fantastic answer. If you're answer. looking for a mentor and they give you answers all the time, continue looking for a mentor. They should be helping you figure out the answers. Sorry, I just want to tie it back to our conversation. Yeah, I've never been in a marketing meeting where that 80-20 was used verbally. Like, I think everybody uses it as a tool in the toolbox. You need to know it. You need to understand it. It's legit. But we're not, we're not dropping jargon like that in, in the tactical execution of the ideas. So... Sometimes I you get that client, though, that has read that article, and they'll come in and they're yep. like, so what's our 80-20 rule, and how are we going to apply that today? Oh, my gosh, those are bad days. Yeah, but that's I when just, you focus on being a, a trusted advisor, right? Like, I want to add that you just have to know what you're doing because there is a discernment that will come to you, and it's not anything that you can describe. It might not be anything that relates to a metric, but you know, if you've just been talking too much about this brand on their platform, that it just doesn't feel right. And I'm not talking about being emotional. And I'm also not talking about the fact that you are supposed to uh, pay attention to your client and your uh, target audience to gauge how you move forward. Because didn't Steve Jobs say, people don't know what they want, you got to give it to them? It's all relative and you have to just evolve and you have to just be very discerning to know whether or not it, it's what you're supposed to be doing. I mean, you just have to be very into yeah. Oh, yeah, and it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> just like with the US Army that I was talking about earlier, even though they tweeted that and it seemed as if it was a very simple request or question, it didn't get very good responses, but they were able to 
come back from it and ask a great question and then give plausible situations that could help. So it's just it's all learning. It's never going to stop. Go ahead, Cindy. I've never been accused of not being able to be heard in the back of the room, but um, I'd like to ask you all about how you see multiculturalism and diversity evolving for us as a profession and um, where do you see us um, going and how can we all be authentic and real and evolve in uh, cultures and diversity that may not be our own? When I was um, working with Starbucks, I was working with them on multicultural um, marketing. And the first thing they did when we walked in the room, which I loved, is they said, we don't believe in multicultural because we're all one community, one society. So it was more, let's understand nuances of what makes you you that we can weave in. Um, and so it took the, the stress out of, I'm the brown guy in the room, let me tell you about all the brown people, or where's my black representation, or my Asian representation, or you know, female, or you know, sexuality, or whatever. It was about the human experience. And that's where I believe multicultural marketing is heading, is into a more of a integrated fabric. Now, with that said, I would say, um, I would add, um, if you are not part of that cultural experience um, as a first person, tread carefully, draw in others that are, and don't feel like you have to adopt or own that experience in order to, be a, to bring it out, because that's when lack of authenticity comes to the forefront, that's when you get in trouble. There are plenty of people that you can pull into the circle and say, what, what, what should we do, what's your idea? Let them drive with you and don't feel like you have to own it all. I would add to that, um, and it's something that we say in my realm of uh, expertise very often, have someone at the table. If you don't know, have someone at the table that can speak to it. Uh, I remember in the early 2000s, Gillette, we were talking to them about doing some promotions and they told me that black women do not shave. <laughs> yes. Um, and it was very startling to me as well, but it showed just 20 years ago that there was a certain ignorance that was personified by them actually voicing it to a black woman who was talking to them about shaving. And they told me that black women do not shave. So at the end of the day, uh, I know that when we went through graduate school, we learned how to um, validate an opinion and you can validate any opinion. And back to your point, even Trump can validate every one of his opinions. Everyone can, whether you want to agree with it or not, it can be validated. But you, it, even with that, like you said, tread lightly and just make sure that you have people at the table who can speak to those other diverse groups so that you can learn. And I would just add, don't be afraid to voice your opinion. So I had a similar experience where I was told women don't drive manual transmissions. Can I do a selfless plug here on LinkedIn? I just put an article up um, last week called The Death of Hispanic Marketing, which talks about these issues and how to address it. So look it up for more insights there as well. You're not in Miami. Um, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> There's no death of Hispanic marketing going on in Miami. Well, it, it's, a, it's a play. Uh -oh. It's clickbait. Oh, nice <laughs> Go like, Why? comment, Do we share. Have it's, it's, it's not dead. Do we have any other? <laughs> yeah. That's a marketing lesson. Right? Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Uh, just from a creative side of the house, it's top of mind. So the creative team is, is drilled to check the boxes of diversity, which is not necessarily a positive thing. And I'm really, we really need stock photography to ramp that up. Like we need to go talk to that industry and say we need a much broader range of creative stock photography. Because most, most businesses don't have a budget to do a photo shoot. So you're going to the stock sites and there, after a very short amount of time, you are exhausted on diversity. It's, I love the fact that you brought that up. Yeah, yeah that is really good. Because it's, my company is launching there you go. blackandbrownish.com. Nice. And we are a stock photography multicultural awesome. uh, platform. Fill the need. Because yeah. all of our, Ask yes, yes. blackandbrownish, yeah, like blackandbrownish.com. Yeah. You can click on it. I'm going to go to the next question. Oh, I want it to finish, but that's oh, okay. go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. It, you know what it is. Black men. Black <laughs> yeah. 
All right, how do you bring integrated marketing into your strategy or the work? So how do you bring traditional advertising, communications, issue management into the work that you guys do? Yeah, I, this is very tactical, but just have all the same people in the room. Let's talk, let's communicate, let's not have silos. Like, I still work with clients or in my own experience personally, where you have like the traditional person not talking to the digital person, not talking to the lead, the man gen person. I'm like, wait, what? Like, you guys sit next to each other. Don't you guys have lunch together or something? Like, go hang out, go talk, be part of each other's lives, see what you guys are doing. Don't just come at the end. So, and also actually, a lot of that too is I see, and again, I'm getting very tactical, but like even a project management perspective, sometimes there's no one actually overseeing all of that. Right. And I'm like, we need people like that to be able to like say, all right, wait, actually, Jen should talk to Bob and Bob should talk to Jessica. Like that doesn't happen. So focus on project management and having people sit at the same table. Great, any questions? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. From my perspective on the creative side, you have your agencies and your teams building your upper funnel work and they're not thinking about the mid and lower funnels. And so you've got fantastic commercials that have a very distinct message that the, the brand wants to push down all the way through the channels and funnels, but the agency didn't think about email. Well, how is that motion going to work as a, as a static image? And so we're constantly having to go back to the agency and say, could you solve that? Or did you guys think about that? Because you should have. And the client's going, well, we probably, probably needed to think about that ahead of time. So you're right. They need, every, the right people need to be in the room, and you need to identify all those channels up front, and then start, as, as you execute the creative, think through how it might live in the different platforms. And because if you don't, it's, you, lose, you lose your through line, you lose your consistency to the campaign, and, it, and that matters. Agreed, and I, I think a lot of that comes from like leadership and management, because I remember like my first years in advertising, I just did my own little community management stuff. I didn't think about how money got made or like where I got paid from or anything like that. I just thought about what I did. But if I understood the bigger picture and how my job impacted someone else's job, then, and that's what I learned throughout the years, and I was like, oh, this is a business that's all running together. I don't just tweet, all right? Like, and that's really my first few years. I'm like, I just tweet, and this is what I do. I wasn't thinking about sales or anything like that. But when you understand the bigger picture and you're part of a big ship that's doing amazing things, and the more that you can work together, the better. And that has to come from leadership, though. Integrated assumed, sorry. Uh, assumes a consistent experience. Yes. And, and I don't think a lot of marketing, this is not seeing the evidence of that necessarily being translated in strategy, um, so. I would say there's also the ability as the person working on it to ask questions. If yeah. you've gone through this program or you've taken integrated classes, you know that your piece isn't the only piece of the bigger puzzle, so feel free to ask. And we as leaders need to do a better job of making sure people understand the big picture, but when people ask, it, inv it invokes whole new conversations and thought processes. Don't, don't be afraid to ask. Any questions out there? Or I'm going to go to my next one. Go ahead. Hi. I'd like to ask one slightly different direction. But uh, I'm curious what this panel thinks about uh, what AI and uh, ass personal assistants are going to do to the future of search and or social media. I, I think in the last presentation, someone said, uh, something on the screen or something about some of the jobs are going to go away because of AI. I'm glad. I have done so much manual research in my career. I'm glad I don't have to do the nuance. What doesn't go away is the creativity and the strategic thinking and the ability to put it all together. So if AI is going to make it easier for me in 20 minutes to get an assessment of what's going on and then be able to work on that, more power to that AI. Amen. Yeah, I, I agree to that. I think even from a humanity perspective, AI is going to be able to do the things that we don't want to do, the things that we shouldn't be focused on as humans so we can have a better human experience. We create more art, connect more, have more face time, right? Because we don't have to worry about doing the menial things. Like even if you think about CPGs, CPGs are fantastic pieces of technology. Before people had to go make bread, before people had to go to like a local bakery to make bread, right, to get bread. But now, because of CPGs, consumer packaged goods, we could just go to the store. So it gives us time to do this kind of stuff. It gives us time to program. It gives us time to create art. So amen. I agree to that 100%. And that's just a humanity perspective, too. I'll just add a little counterpoint. I think I agree with everything that's being said. But I think as um, integrated marketers, we also have the uh, 
ability to counsel on the future and the risks that might come with AI. So we've already seen unconscious bias in some algorithms that Microsoft. Have, yeah, that have hurt us. So I think when you're working with your clients, if you're using AI and you're trying new things, you also just have to be aware of what possibly might go sideways and what does that mean for an issue or a crisis management. Just big plug because I've been through a lot. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna go to the next one. We hear the term data-driven marketing all the time. What does it really mean? You know, I'm part of this panel, um, online panel community, it's called Currents. Has anyone uh, familiar with Current or heard of it? Look it up, it's a really, um, it's an online community of market leaders and they talk about single subject um, um, discussions and we went through an eight week discussion on data-driven marketing and it was fascinating because there's so much nuance to what that means. What, but at, in essence, what I took away and what I still believe to be true is we need to understand whatever. We just need to understand in order to be better at what we do. So the opportunity, the ability as marketers to have research, have, and not only the research, but to be able then to drive or derive insights out of that research is a key skill that I fear is going away because we rely too much on a computer to spit something out. But how do you grab all the data and then be able to parse it and figure out what does that mean and then be able to apply it? So when I look at that data-driven marketing, to me, it's a starting point for what the rest of the marketing experience should be. I think Joshua's presentation earlier today was a great example of data-driven marketing. From a creative, from a creative perspective, it's a little scary. You're gonna take away my ability to come up with that really crazy, dumb idea that there's no reason for it other than to be, it's just awesome. Um, so we, you know, creatives get a little nervous about that, but good data, I'd like to see good data-driven marketing, insightful data, someone can take it and tell me exactly what the data's gonna inform the creative, can be very useful and a lot of fun. Any other questions out there? Yep, go ahead. to see the data. <laughs> I mean, there's risk in everything that we do, right? But you can click on half of them and give feedback. So as the process gets better, we're learning. I mean, there's risk no matter what. And that and we all have to be willing to take it. Comes into. You, we're yeah, in a world of so much noise. So how do you stand out from the pack? Sometimes less is better. Sometimes take the time to really understand that and then come up with something that just touches that consumer you're trying to reach in the right spot, but you're fighting against all these different channels all the time, so. And you're, and you're testing. Yeah. If you're testing, then you'll know and you'll abort and try something else. Well, you said earlier, I mean, that's 100% true. I gotta check the data, right? Like, <laughs> if it's, it's true, it may, that may happen, yeah, and that might be a concern, but now we know, and now we need to change, and the A-B testing will allow us to figure out what we need to be doing. Any other questions? All right. How do you prioritize which new skills to acquire? Passion, what I'm good at first, and then I'll try to press into the things I'm not so good at. Yeah, I look for something that gives me that fire that doesn't feel like I'm working. Like I wanna learn this new thing and I wanna focus on it and I wanna do it more than anything else. And then I focus on that. All right, I'm gonna go to the next one. How do these skills impact you when you're hiring a team and working with other people? We touched on this a little bit earlier, but. When I do hiring, it's more of a cultural fit. And I don't mean a black culture. I mean, it is a culture. What does Hip Rockstar stand for? What are the things that we do? Um, uh, I'm the president of a company called Hip Rockstar. We're a fully integrated marketing and communications firm. We have our own company culture. And if someone can come with great skills, uh, but like, for example, they're not people oriented and they can't hold a conversation and look someone square in the eye and have a conversation that's meaningful, then Hip Rockstar might not be the place for them. So for us, it's more than skills and degrees. 
it's more of a culture fit to be able to service our clients the way that they're accustomed to being serviced. And I, when, when I agree, and when I hire people for my team, I try to figure out what don't I want to do and how do I get someone to do it. Um, but, but frankly, um, it's a, only a half um, truth on that. Um, sometimes it's okay, it's uh, not sometimes, all the time it's okay to have people that don't do what you do and bring them alongside, because I, I think I'm great at everything, but really I'm not, so I gotta have other people. Yeah, no, th those are all great answers, and to add to that from like a technical perspective, the number one thing to drive me crazy when I'm interviewing someone and I go, do you have any questions for me? They're like, no, that's a bad sign for me. I want someone who's curious, that wants to know, ask questions, and that's how I tell someone's a good cultural fit for my team is usually like I want someone like yeah tell me about this and tell me about that what do you do here like I want to see and feel that excitement when someone's like I don't have any questions I'm like can we end this I agree you need to do your homework come come to the table knowing what we do and what we're about and what value you bring to the team because it's not really about you it's about what you can do for and it's about you but it's it's filling the role um, and so I always try to scare people off <laughs> Any questions in the audience? Get out all of right. here. That was, all, that was all our prepared questions, so it's all on you guys. You got time. What other questions do you have? Go ahead, Nick. Oh, oh. So um, <clears throat> if you're nervous about a new project or a new post or something like that, if you ever have that anxiety, are you ever afraid of what the risks are and are you afraid to put it out? How, what's your confidence level like on something where you're very iffy about, and how afraid are you of it to not work? If I'm iffy about it, I'm definitely not pre uh, presenting it to my clients. I have to be very passionate about it. I have to like it. Believe After it. it's created, I want to go back and look at it. I want to test it out. I want to say it. I actually fall in love with it before I present it to any of my clients. I mean, even with my speech today, I just kept reading over it and over it, and I'm like, oh, this is so good. I hope they learn from this. This is great. <laughs> because at the end of the day, you, wanna, you want to have an impact. And so if there's no connection and you're not passionate about it and you're iffy, that might not be what you want to present. I want her job. <laughs> um, in, in our role, we're cranking creative all the time and you're not gonna have passion for everything. And so you always feel worse if you didn't raise your hand. So if you go, if you go ahead and do it and you, you have this nagging thing, you didn't let the leadership know, you're gonna feel a lot worse that you didn't, especially if it goes south. So I, you know, have the guts to, to let the people know, hey, this is a problem. And you may not have the option to change it, but you can spend the time as a team, how are you gonna spin it? I've, we've done that thousands of times. Oh crap, we made a mistake, you know, this isn't right. How are we gonna spin it? To, so the client doesn't have to know about the tension. It's all internal as a team, we're solving the problem. Yeah, that's really good. And I think anxiety and worry, that's also on a spectrum, right? It doesn't always mean one thing or the other all the time. Like, I completely agree, like even my presentation, every presentation I give, I'm confident in. But right before I get up, I'm nervous. And I'm not nervous that it's not gonna do well or anything, I'm just nervous, because I care and I'm like excited. And, Maybe my brain works differently and it turns it into anxiousness or something, but it just means that I care and I want it to be good. And so I think also this is where preparation comes into play. Um, if your team understands your brand, your client, whatever it is, you can come into it with a little more confidence. It doesn't mean that you always hit it out of the park. We fall and fail all the time. And failure is good. You know, you learn and you get new insights and as long as you get back up and figure it out, just make sure you don't um, impact the bottom line of the stock too much. Yeah, I would also say that you have to separate, is the anxiety personal or is the anxiety about the work? So we have a lot of junior folks who are more introverted than maybe a lot of integrated marketing professionals might have been in the past. And so we've talked a lot about um, doing improv and, learn, and being able to just kind of roll with it so that you personally are more comfortable presenting your ideas or speaking up if you're worried so that's a tip that quite a few young people in our um, organization have been trying. Let me um, close by adding that when you asked the question originally, I was understanding it as in what I think would be best for the client. So if I don't think it's best for the client, then, and I'm feeling iffy about that, then I'm not gonna present it. Me being passionate about something that I present does not mean that the client loves it. 
<laughs> so there's, there's two different things. Um, there have been many things that I've loved and they don't. And then I have to go ahead and take their feedback and integrate it in the best way that I know that the customer can receive it, which is a completely different thing in my mind. And that's not what you asked, but I just wanted to make sure I was clear. And then the other way I heard your answer, um, your question being answered, was in presentation and whether or not you get nervous when presenting um, a project or a solution for a client. I'm always nervous, always. But I love the fear. I'm just kind of crazy like that. Yeah, use it. <laughs> because if I'm afraid, I just, I go for it like 150% more. I'm like, I'm not gonna be fearful of anything, even when I am being fearful. Makes no sense, but that's just how I'm made. Um, so hopefully one of those four answers answered your question. <laughs> Any other questions? So, two-part question. Have you ever said no to a client? And have you ever was not? I mean, have you ever say, uh, or ever deal with a client that is a topic that's difficult to, to you know, present it in a, in a marketing way? And I'd like to hear those examples. Yeah. From everybody. Yeah. No, I, mean, I could jump in. We were talking about this, actually, earlier. I've never really said no to a client. I kind of have a rule where I will tell you twice and I will have it in writing and I will make sure that you understand everything and why I'm presenting this idea and why this is the best route. And of course there's spectrum. Like if they want me to do some crazy stuff, of course I can say no. But like generally speaking on my everyday business, I'll tell them once, I'll be like, listen, I don't agree, I don't agree. The second time I'll tell them, I don't agree, I don't agree. The third time I'm like, all right, how can we figure this out and make it the very best? Because looking at it straight from a business perspective, I'm a business owner, I run my own business too. I need to make money too, and I want to create good projects and all that, but I'm always balancing both. I'm like, all right, let's do this. I'm going to help you do it the, the very best you possibly can. Because at the end of the day, I could lose that client. And that's a decision that you can make, whether you want to lose that client and that's good for you or not. But generally speaking, I'll go forward and say, all right, well, you wanted this. Because I've seen people say no and be so difficult that then all of a sudden they lose that business anyway. Yeah. Um have to be okay with what happened to the client, yeah. um, for sure. Um, to me, um, one of those metrics is my integrity and the integrity of my company and my team. Uh, several years back, um, we were um, invited to come out to a client's um, headquarters. Um, we had just finished presenting the whole annual strategy, and they wanted to give us feedback. Within their feedback, they were crazy, and they wanted to go a completely different direction that didn't make sense for anyone. That wasn't the problem, because you can always work out with that. The problem was that they wanted to hold us accountable to their strategy, even though their strategy was not vetted with anything. So we had this discussion, this debate, and all of a sudden the CEO of the company comes out and sits down, and he's like, you guys are gonna have to sign the contract today based on our new strategy, and that's all you're gonna do. So I turned, I, I was the head of the creative team, and I turned to my president who was with me, and we both turned back and we said, if that's the case, we resign your account, and we resign that account. Multi-million dollars, we just walked out because we weren't gonna put up our integrity of our company of who we were just for money. For us, it's, it is about that brand recognition. If at the end of the day, what you're asking us to do just does not align with what we want, then I'll just turn away from it. Um, and even in the midst of a contract, when clients have decided that they want to take a, a different strategy and a different route, uh, I've gone ahead and written an email, thank them for the service that we have had thus far, but at the end of the month, we will cease our relationship with you because of X, Y, and Z. And I just have to live with that because at the end of the day, if it's not gonna make sense for our brand and you going out and saying that this company, our company did this for you. Uh-uh. No, you're not gonna pull me into that foolishness. Can I add one more thing and then I, I gotta leave to catch a plane, so I just wanna leave you with this too. Remember also, it's not your sandbox. So fight the fights that are worth fighting and other times, who cares, you know? Someone asked me this morning in a session uh, about this and I'm like, look, I care about what I do, I love what I do, but it's not my product. If you want to say that your product is blue even though it's great, fine. Let's talk about it. Let's figure it out. I'm not going to fight for that. I'm just not going to lie for you. I'm not going to pretend that it's not real. I'm not going to do anything that um, goes against who I am. But I don't care that the doohickey that if 
whatever you want to highlight, it's your sandbox, it's your toy. I got to decide if I want to play in that sandbox. So thank you all, I got to go. Thank you. So, I say no to clients in my head all the time. Uh, not really in the position to say no in general, but we do say no to scope of work. They'll try to sneak in. Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? And we're like, yeah, no, I don't think, even though we, there's, there's the potential for it to be a positive, many times it taxes the team and we, we have to say, say no. Um, in, in terms of the work, the short way of saying, uh, what we, in the creative industry we say, tell them once, tell them twice, and then take their money. And it's kind of a tacky way to say it, but it really helps remove the anxiety. You're doing a very good job. You presented them the best possible solutions. You put your heart into it. They don't want it. Okay, well, let's try it again. They don't want it. Okay, well, now, like Hugo said, we're going to work this out. And you, you, hopefully you're all future clients. And hopefully we're all working together in the future. And you guys can come to the table um, with a very clear idea of what you want. And we can collaborate. The best part, it's a, it's a bad partnership. If you're having to have that conversation, it's probably not going to last very long. They're going to know you're thinking no now, though. <laughs> Excellent panel. I had a general question about the agency client relationship. So obviously every client's unique and demands are unique, but over time you can see trends. Where do you see the trends going forward between that client and agency relationship and how are you guys planning for those trends? Yeah, um, and let me know if this doesn't really answer your question so much, but uh, I'm seeing a lot of agencies actually becoming more consultancies and consultancies really is, are the biggest threats to agencies. Accenture just bought Droga5. Droga5, if you don't know them, they're a big agency in New York. They do The Rock, Under Armour, things like that. They just bought them. And even my, my last days at 360i and like what I do now, basically I was a consultant. I was helping other teams, making sure that they were doing amazing work, that they were doing what they needed to do. And I was consulting a heck of a lot more. Even with brands that had internal agencies, I just came in as a consultant. And, and that's basically what I do now, mostly. There's a, there's a lot of really interesting things happening right now between agencies and in-house. A month ago, uh, we worked with BBDO, Hearts and Science, um, Critical Mass, and now we work with Omnicom. We don't, we don't refer to them as their individual agencies, and each one had a very specific role in the marketing mix, and they've decided they want to be called Omnicom, which I think shows value to AT&T as we are so big, we can do all of this for you. And you can just call us by one name. You don't have to keep track of anything anymore. We're just we're your one-stop shop to get all of this done, media buying to the creative to all the other aspects. So I think agencies are being hard pressed to show value, and and uh, so much so like not only show value but expertise on the business. Why wouldn't I go with an in-house team that knows my business really well and probably saves me a little bit of money? When you have to have vision and you have to have strong leadership to do that. But I know um, Pepsi just revamped their in-house team and they're doing some really good work and they, they killed their agency. Oh, thanks, but no thanks. 20 years, don't need you anymore. Re really interesting stuff. So I, I think we'll, we'll, we'll have to see and watch. You know, I may be looking for a job next week. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. I think we'll wrap a little early. Thank, Thank you very you. much to Thank our Thank you. panel. Uh, just a quick announcement. We are gonna, um, we're offering a WVU campus tour. We have one of the tour guides.